Whiskey Bob got me aside a moment. Keep your eyes open, he muttered. Take my tip. French Frank's ugly. I'm going up river with him to get a schooner for oystering. When he gets down on the beds, watch out. He says he'll run you down. After dark, any time he's around, change your anchorage and douse your riding light. Savvy? Oh, certainly. I savvy. I nodded my head, and as one man to another thanked him for his tip and drifted back to the group at the bar. No, I did not treat. I never dreamed that I was expected to treat. I left with spider, and my ears burn now as I try to surmise the things they must have said about me. I asked Spider, in an offhand way, what was eating French Frank. He's crazy jealous of you, was the answer. Do you think so, I said, and dismissed the matter as not worth thinking about. But I leave it to anyone, the swell of my fifteen years old manhood, at learning that French Frank, the adventurer of fifty, the sailor of all the seas of all the world, was jealous of me, and jealous over a girl most romantically named the Queen of the Oyster Pirates. I had read of such things in books, and regarded them as personal probabilities of a distant maturity. Oh, I felt a rare young devil as we hoisted the mainsail that morning, broke out anchor, and filled away close-hauled on the three-mile beat to windward out into the bay. Such was my escape from the killing machine toil and my introduction to the oyster pirates. True, the introduction had begun with drink, and the life promised to continue with drink. But was I to stay away from it for such a reason? Wherever life ran free and great, there men drank romance and adventure seemed always to go down the street locked arm in arm with john barleycorn to know the two i must know the third or else i must go back to my free library books and read of the deeds of other men and do no deeds of my own save slave for ten cents an hour at a machine in a cannery. No, I was not to be deterred from this brave life on the water by the fact that the water-dwellers had queer and expensive desires for beer and wine and whiskey. What if their notions of happiness included the strange one of seeing me drink? When they persisted in buying the stuff and thrusting it upon me, why, I would drink it. It was the price I would pay for their comradeship. And I didn't have to get drunk. I had not got drunk the Sunday afternoon I arranged to buy the razzle-dazzle despite the fact that not one of the rest was sober. Well, I could go on into the future that way, drinking the stuff when it gave them pleasure that I should drink it, but carefully avoiding over-drinking. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Gradual as was my development as a heavy drinker among the oyster pirates, the real heavy drinking came suddenly, and was the result not of desire for alcohol, but of an intellectual conviction. The more I saw of the life, the more I was enamored of it, 
I can never forget my thrills the first night I took part in a concerted raid when we assembled on board the Annie, rough men, big and unafraid, and weazened wharf rats, some of them ex-convicts, all of them enemies of the law and meriting jail, in sea boots and sea gear, talking in gruff low voices, and Big George with revolvers strapped about his waist to show that he meant business. Oh, I know, looking back, that the whole thing was sordid and silly. But I was not looking back in those days when I was rubbing shoulders with John Barleycorn and beginning to accept him. The life was brave and wild, and I was living the adventure I had read so much about. Nelson, young Scratch, they called him, to distinguish him from old Scratch, his father, sailed in the sloop Reindeer, partners with one Clam. Clam was a daredevil, but Nelson was a reckless maniac. He was twenty years old with the body of a Hercules. When he was shot in Benicia a couple of years later, the coroner said he was the greatest shouldered man he had ever seen laid on a slab. Nelson could not read or write. He had been dragged up by his father on San Francisco Bay, and boats were second nature with him. His strength was prodigious, and his reputation along the waterfront for violence was anything but savory. He had berserker rages and did mad, terrible things. I made his acquaintance the first cruise of the Razzle Dazzle, and saw him sail the reindeer in a blow and dredge oysters all around the rest of us as we lay at two anchors troubled with fear of going ashore. He was some man, this Nelson, and when, passing by the last chance saloon, he spoke to me, I felt very proud but try to imagine my pride when he promptly asked me in to have a drink. I stood at the bar and drank a glass of beer with him and talked manfully of oysters and boats and of the mystery of who had put the load of buckshot through the Annie's mainsail. We talked and lingered at the bar, it seemed to me strange that we lingered. We had had our beer. But who was I to lead the way outside when Great Nelson chose to lean against the bar? After a few minutes, to my surprise, he asked me to have another drink, which I did. And still we talked, and Nelson evinced no intention of leaving the bar. Bear with me while I explain the way of my reasoning and of my innocence. First of all, I was very proud to be in the company of Nelson, who was the most heroic figure among the oyster pirates and bay adventurers. Unfortunately for my stomach and mucous membranes, Nelson had a strange quirk of nature that made him find happiness in treating me to a beer. I had no moral disinclination for beer, and just because I didn't like the taste of it and the weight of it was no reason I should forgo the honor of his company. It was his whim to drink beer, and to have me drink beer with him. Very well, I would put up with the passing discomfort. So we continued to talk at the bar and to drink beer ordered and paid for by Nelson. I think now, when I look back upon it, that Nelson was curious. 
He wanted to find out just what kind of a gink I was. He wanted to see how many times I'd let him treat without offering to treat in return. After I had drunk half a dozen glasses, my policy of temperateness in mind, I decided that I had had enough for that time. So I mentioned that I was going aboard the Razzle Dazzle, then lying at the city wharf a hundred yards away. I said good-bye to Nelson and went on down the wharf. But John Barleycorn, to the extent of six glasses, went with me. My brain tingled and was very much alive. I was uplifted by my sense of manhood. I, truly true oyster pirate, was going aboard my own boat after hobnobbing in the last chance with Nelson, the greatest oyster pirate of us all. Strong in my brain was the vision of us leaning against the bar and drinking beer. And curious it was, I decided, this whim of nature that made men happy in spending good money for beer for a fellow like me who didn't want it. As I pondered this, I recollected that several times other men, in couples, had entered the last chance, and first one, then the other, had treated to drinks. I remembered, on the drunk on the idler, how Scotty and the harpooner and myself had raked and scraped dimes and nickels with which to buy the whiskey. Then came my boy code, when on a day a fellow gave another a cannonball or a chunk of taffy, on some other day he would expect to receive back a cannonball or a chunk of taffy. That was why Nelson had lingered at the bar. Having bought a drink, he had waited for me to buy one. I had let him buy six drinks and I never once offered to treat. And he was the great Nelson. I could feel myself blushing with shame. I sat down on the stringer piece of the wharf and buried my face in my hands. And the heat of my shame burned up my neck and into my cheeks and forehead. I have blushed many times in my life but never have I experienced so terrible a blush as that one. And sitting there on the stringer piece in my shame, I did a great deal of thinking and transvaluing of values. I had been born poor. Poor I had lived. I had gone hungry on occasion. I had never had toys nor playthings like other children. My first memories of life were pinched by poverty. The pinch of poverty had been chronic. I was eight years old when I wore my first little undershirt actually sold in a store across the counter. And then it had been only one little undershirt. When it was soiled, I had to return to the awful homemade things until it was washed. I had been so proud of it that I insisted on wearing it without any outer garment. For the first time I mutinied against my mother, mutinied myself into hysteria until she let me wear the store undershirt so all the world could see. Only a man who has undergone famine can properly value food. Only sailors and desert dwellers know the meaning of fresh water and only a child with a child's imagination can come to know the meaning of things it has long been denied i early discovered that the only things i could have were those i got for myself my meager childhood developed meagerness the first thing i had been able to get for myself had been cigarette pictures, 
cigarette posters, and cigarette albums. I had not had the spending of the money I earned, so I traded extra newspapers for these treasures. I traded duplicates with the other boys, and circulating, as I did, all about town, I had greater opportunities for trading and acquiring. It was not long before I had complete every series issued by every cigarette manufacturer, such as the Great Race Horses, Parisian Beauties, Women of All Nations, Flags of All Nations, Noted Actors, Champion Prize Fighters, etc., and each series I had three different ways, in the card from the cigarette package, in the poster, and in the album. Then I began to accumulate duplicate sets, duplicate albums. I traded for other things that boys valued, and which they usually bought with money given them by their parents. Naturally, they did not have the keen sense of values that I had, who was never given money to buy anything. I traded for postage stamps, for minerals, for curios, for bird's eggs, for marbles. I had a more magnificent collection of agates than I have ever seen any boy possess and the nucleus of the collection was a handful worth of at least three dollars which i had kept as security for twenty cents i loaned to a messenger boy who was sent to reform school before he could redeem them i'd trade anything and everything for anything else and turn it over in a dozen more trades until it was transmuted into something that was worth something. I was famous as a trader. I was notorious as a miser. I could even make a junk man weep when I had dealings with him. Other boys called me in to sell for them their collection of bottles, rags, old iron, grain, and gunny sacks, and five-gallon oil cans, ay, and give me a commission for doing it. And this was the thrifty, close-fisted boy, accustomed to slave at a machine for ten cents an hour, who sat on the stringer piece and considered the matter of beer at five cents a glass and gone in a moment with nothing to show for it. I was now with men I admired. I was proud to be with them. Had all my pinching and saving brought me equivalent of one of the many thrills which had been mine since I came among the oyster pirates. Then what was worth while, money or thrills? These men had no horror of squandering a nickel or many nickels. They were magnificently careless of money, calling up eight men to drink whiskey at ten cents a glass, as French Frank had shown. Why, Nelson had just spent sixty cents on beer for the two of us. Which was it to be? I was aware that I was making a grave decision. I was deciding between money and men, between niggardliness and romance. Either I must throw overboard all my old values of money and look upon it as something to be flung about wastefully, or I must throw overboard my comradeship with these men whose peculiar quirks made them like strong drink. I retraced my steps up the wharf to the last chance where Nelson still stood outside. Come on and have a beer, I invited. Again we stood at the bar and drank and talked but this time it was I who paid ten cents. 
a whole hour of my labor at a machine for a drink of something I didn't want and which tasted rotten. But it wasn't difficult. I had achieved a concept. Money no longer counted. It was comradeship that counted. Have another, I asked. And we had another, and I paid for it. Nelson, with the wisdom of the skilled drinker, said to the barkeeper, Make mine a small one, Johnny. Johnny nodded and gave him a glass that contained only a third as much as the glasses we had been drinking. Yet the charge was the same, five cents. By this time I was getting nicely jingled, so such extravagance didn't hurt me much. Besides, I was learning. There was more in this buying of drinks than mere quantity. I got my finger on it. There was a stage when the beer didn't count at all, but just the spirit of comradeship of drinking together. And ha! Another thing. I, too, could call for small beers and minimize by two-thirds the detestable freightage with which comradeship burdened one. I had to go aboard to get some money, I remarked casually as we drank, in the hope Nelson would take it as an explanation of why I had let him treat six consecutive times. Oh, well, you didn't have to do that, he answered. Johnny'll trust a fellow like you, won't you, Johnny? Sure, Johnny agreed with a smile. How much you got down against me? Nelson queried. Johnny pulled out the book he kept behind the bar, found Nelson's page, and added up the account of several dollars. At once I became possessed with a desire to have a page in that book. Almost it seemed the final badge of manhood. After a couple more drinks, for which I insisted on paying, Nelson decided to go. We parted true comradely, and I wandered down the wharf to the razzle-dazzle. Spider was just building the fire for supper. Where'd you get it? He grinned up at me through the open companion. Oh, I've been with Nelson, I said carelessly, trying to hide my pride. Then an idea came to me. Here was another one of them. Now that I had achieved my concept, I might as well practice it thoroughly. Come on, I said, up to Johnny's and have a drink. Going up the wharf, we met Clam coming down. Clam was Nelson's partner, and he was a fine, brave, handsome, moustached man of thirty. Everything, in short, that his nickname did not connote. Come on, I said, and have a drink. He came. As we turned into the last chance, there was Pat, the Queen's brother, coming out. What's your hurry? I greeted him. We're having a drink. Come on along. I've just had one, he demurred. What of it? We're having one now, I retorted. And Pat consented to join us and I melted my way into his good graces with a couple of glasses of beer. Oh, I was learning things that afternoon about John Barleycorn. There was more in him than the bad taste when you swallowed him. Here, at the absurd cost of ten cents, a gloomy, grouchy individual who threatened to become an enemy was made into a good friend. 
he became even genial his looks were kindly and our voices mellowed together as we talked waterfront and oyster bed gossip small beer for me johnny i said when the others had ordered schooners yes and i said it like the accustomed drinker carelessly casually as a sort of spontaneous thought that had just occurred to me looking back i am confident that the only one there who guessed i was a tyro at bar drinking was johnny heinhold where'd he get it i overheard spider confidentially ask johnny oh he's been sousin here with nelson all afternoon was johnny's answer i never let on that i'd heard but proud i even the barkeeper was giving me a recommendation as a man he's been sousin here with nelson all afternoon magic words the accolade delivered by a barkeeper with a beer glass i remembered that french frank had treated johnny the day i bought the razzle dazzle the glasses were filled and we were ready to drink have something yourself johnny i said with an air of having intended to say it all the time but of having been a trifle remiss because of the interesting conversation i had been holding with clam and pat johnny looked at me with quick sharpness divining i am positive the strides i was making in my education and poured himself whiskey from his private bottle this hit me for a moment on my thrifty side he had taken a ten-cent drink when the rest of us were drinking five-cent drinks but the hurt was only for a moment i dismissed it as ignoble remembering my concept and did not give myself away you'd better put me down in the book for this i said when we had finished the drink and i had the satisfaction of seeing a fresh page devoted to my name and a charge penciled for a round of drinks amounting to thirty cents and i glimpsed as through a golden haze a future wherein that page would be much charged and crossed off and charged again i treated a second time around and then to my amazement johnny redeemed himself in that matter of the ten-cent drink he treated us around from behind the bar and i decided that he had arithmetically evened things up handsomely let's go around to the st louis house spider suggested when we got outside pat who had been shoveling coal all day had gone home and clam had gone upon the reindeer to cook supper so around spider and i went to the st louis house my first visit a huge barroom where perhaps fifty men mostly longshoremen were congregated and there i met soup kennedy for the second time and bill kelly and smith of the annie drifted in he of the belt buckled revolvers and nelson showed up and i met others including the vigi brothers who ran the place and the chiefest of all joe goose with the wicked eyes the twisted nose and the flowered vest who played the harmonica like a roistering angel and who went on the most atrocious tears that even the oakland waterfront could conceive of and admire as i bought drinks others treated as well the thought flickered across my mind that mammy jenny 
wasn't going to be repaid much on her loan out of that week's earnings of the razzle-dazzle. But what of it, I thought, or rather John Barleycorn thought it for me. You're a man, and you're getting acquainted with men. Mammy Jenny doesn't need the money as promptly as all that. She isn't starving. You know that. She's got other money in the bank. Let her wait, and pay her back gradually. And thus it was I learned another trait of John Barleycorn. He inhibits morality. Wrong conduct that is impossible for one to do sober is done quite easily when one is not sober. In fact, it is the only thing one can do, for John Barleycorn's inhibition rises like a wall between one's immediate desires and long-learned morality. I dismissed my thought of debt to Mammy Jenny and proceeded to get acquainted at the trifling expense of some trifling money and a jingle that was growing unpleasant. Who took me on board and put me to bed that night I do not know, but I imagine it must have been Spider. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 and so I won my manhood spurs. My status on the waterfront and with the oyster pirates became immediately excellent. I was looked upon as a good fellow as well as no coward. And somehow, from the day I achieved that concept sitting on the stringer piece of the Oakland City Wharf, I have never cared much for money. No one has ever considered me a miser since, while my carelessness of money is a source of anxiety and worry to some that know me. So completely did I break with my parsimonious past that I sent word home to my mother to call in the boys of the neighborhood and give to them all my collections. I never even cared to learn what boys got what collections. I was a man now, and I made a clean sweep of everything that bound me to my boyhood. My reputation grew when the story went around the waterfront of how French Frank had tried to run me down with his schooner, and of how I had stood on the deck of the Razzle Dazzle, a cocked, double-barrel shotgun in my hands, steering with my feet, and holding her to her course, and compelled him to put up his wheel and keep away, the waterfront decided that there was something in me despite my youth. And I continued to show what was in me. There were the times I brought the razzle-dazzle in with a bigger load of oysters than any other two-man craft. There was the time when we raided far down in Lower Bay, and mine was the only craft back at daylight to the anchorage off Asparagus Island. There was the Thursday night we raced for market, and I brought the razzle-dazzle in without a rudder, first of the fleet, and skimmed the cream of the Friday morning trade. And there was the time I brought her in from Upper Bay under a jib when Scotty burned my mainsail. Yes, it was Scotty of the Idler adventure. Irish had followed Spider on board the Razzle Dazzle, and Scotty, turning up, had taken Irish's place. But the things I did on the water only partly counted. What completed everything, and won for me the title of Prince of the Oyster Beds, was that I was a good fellow ashore with my money, buying drinks like a man. I little dreamed that the time would come when the Oakland waterfront, which had shocked me at first, would be shocked and annoyed 
by the devilry of the things I did. But always the life was tied up with drinking. The saloons are poor men's clubs. Saloons are congregating places. We engaged to meet one another in saloons. We celebrated our good fortune or wept our grief in saloons. We got acquainted in saloons. Can I ever forget the afternoon I met Old Scratch, Nelson's father? It was in the last chance. Johnny Heinhold introduced us. That old Scratch was Nelson's father was noteworthy enough. But there was more to it than that. He was owner and master of the scow schooner Annie Mine, and some day I might ship as a sailor with him. Still more, he was romance. He was a blue-eyed, yellow-haired, raw-boned Viking, big-bodied and strong-muscled despite his age and he had sailed the seas in ships of all nations in the old savage sailing days. I had heard many weird tales about him and worshipped him from a distance. It took the saloon to bring us together. Even so, our acquaintance might have been no more than a hand grip and a word. He was a laconic old fellow had it not been for the drinking. "'Have a drink,' I said with promptitude, after the pause which I had learned good form in drinking dictates. Of course, while we drank our beer, which I had paid for, it was incumbent on him to listen to me and to talk to me. And Johnny, like a true host, made the tactful remarks that enabled us to find mutual topics of conversation. And, of course, having drunk my beer, Captain Nelson must now buy beer in turn. This led to more talking, and Johnny drifted out of the conversation to wait on other customers. The more beer Captain Nelson and I drank, the better we got acquainted. In me he found an appreciative listener, who by virtue of book reading knew much about the sea life he had lived. So he drifted back to his wild young days, and spun many a rare yarn for me, while we downed beer treat by treat, although a blessed summer afternoon and it was only John Barleycorn that made possible that long afternoon with the old sea-dog. It was Johnny Heinhold who secretly warned me across the bar that I was getting pickled and advised me to take small beers. But as soon as Captain Nelson drank large beers... My pride forbade anything else than large beers. And not until the skipper ordered his first small beer did I order one for myself. Oh, when we came to a lingering fond farewell, I was drunk. But I had the satisfaction of seeing old Scratch as drunk as I. My youthful modesty scarcely let me dare believe that the hardened old buccaneer was even more drunk. And afterwards, from Spider and Pat and Clam and Johnny Heinhold and others, came the tips that old Scratch liked me, and had nothing but good words for the fine lad I was which was the more remarkable because he was known as a savage, cantankerous old cuss who never liked anybody. His very nickname, Scratch, arose from a berserker trick of his in fighting of tearing off his opponent's face. And that I had won his friendship, all thanks were due, 
to John Barleycorn. I have given the incident merely as an example of the multitudinous lures and draws and services by which John Barleycorn wins his followers. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 And still there arose in me no desire for alcohol, no chemical demand. In years and years of heavy drinking, drinking did not beget the desire. Drinking was the way of life I led, the way of the men with whom I lived. While away on my cruises on the bay, I took no drink along and while out on the bay the thought of the desirableness of a drink never crossed my mind. It was not until I tied the razzle-dazzle up to the wharf and got ashore in the congregating places of men where drink flowed that the buying of drinks for other men and the accepting of drinks from other men devolved upon me as a social duty and a manhood right. Then, too, there were the times lying at the city wharf or across the estuary on the sand pit when the queen and her sister and her brother Pat and Mrs. Hadley came aboard. It was my boat, I was host, and I could only dispense hospitality in the terms of their understanding of it. So I would rush Spider, or Irish, or Scotty, or whoever was my crew, with the can for beer and the demijohn for red wine. And again, lying at the wharf disposing of my oysters, there were dusky twilights when big policemen and plain men stole on board. And because we lived in the shadow of the police, we opened oysters and fed them to them with squirts of pepper sauce and rushed the growler or got stronger stuff in bottles. Drink as I would, I couldn't come to like John Barleycorn. I valued him extremely well for his associations, but not for the taste of him. All the time I was striving to be a man amongst men, and all the time I nursed secret and shameful desires for candy. But I would have died before I'd let anybody guess it. I used to indulge in lonely debauches, on nights when I knew my crew was going to sleep ashore. I would go up to the free library, exchange my books, buy a quarter's worth of all sorts of candy that chewed and lasted, sneak aboard the razzle-dazzle, lock myself in the cabin, go to bed, and lie there long hours of bliss, reading and chewing candy. And those were the only times I felt that I got my real money's worth dollars and dollars across the bar couldn't buy the satisfaction that twenty-five cents did in a candy store as my drinking grew heavier i began to note more and more that it was in the drinking bouts the purple passages occurred drunks were always memorable at such times things happened Men like Joe Goose dated existence from drunk to drunk. The longshoremen all looked forward to their Saturday night drunk. We of the oyster boats waited until we had disposed of our cargoes before we got really started, though a scattering of drinks and a meeting of a chance friend sometimes precipitated an accidental drunk. In ways, the accidental drunks were the best. 
stranger and more exciting things happened at such times as for instance the sunday when nelson and french frank and captain spink stole the stolen salmon boat from whiskey bob and nicky the greek changes had taken place in the personnel of the oyster boats nelson had got into a fight with bill kelly on the annie and was carrying a bullet hole through his left hand also having quarrelled with clam and broken partnership nelson had sailed the reindeer his arm in a sling with a crew of two deep-water sailors and he had sailed so madly as to frighten them ashore such was the tale of his recklessness they spread that no one on the waterfront would go out with nelson so the reindeer crewless lay across the estuary at the sand spit beside her lay the razzle dazzle with a burned mainsail and scotty and me on board whiskey bob had fallen out with french frank and gone on a raid up river with nicky the greek the result of this raid was a brand new columbia river salmon boat stolen from an italian fisherman we oyster pirates were all visited by the searching italian and we were convinced from what we knew of their movements that whiskey bob and nicky the greek were the guilty parties but where was the salmon boat hundreds of greek and italian fishermen up river and down the bay had searched every slough and tool patch for it when the owner despairingly offered a reward of fifty dollars our interest increased and the mystery deepened one sunday morning old captain spink paid me a visit the conversation was confidential he had just been fishing in his skiff at the old alameda ferry slip as the tide went down he had noticed a rope tied to a pile under water and leading downward in vain he had tried to heave up what was fast on the other end farther along to another pile was a similar rope leading downward and unheavable without doubt it was the missing salmon boat if we restored it to its rightful owner there was fifty dollars in it for us but i had queer ethical notions about honor amongst thieves and declined to have anything to do with the affair but french frank had quarrelled with whiskey bob and nelson was also an enemy poor whiskey bob without viciousness good-natured generous born weak raised poorly with an irresistible chemical demand for alcohol still prosecuting his vocation of bay pirate his body was picked up not long afterward beside a dock where it had sunk full of gunshot wounds within an hour after i had rejected captain spink's proposal i saw him sail down the estuary on board the reindeer with nelson also french frank went by on his schooner it was not long ere they sailed back up the estuary curiously side by side as they headed in for the sand spit the submerged salmon boat could be seen gunwales awash and held up from sinking by ropes fast to the schooner and the sloop the tide was half out and they sailed squarely in on the sand grounding in a row with the salmon boat in the middle immediately hans one of french frank's sailors was into a skiff and pulling rapidly for the north slope 
the big demijohn in the stern sheets told his errand they couldn't wait a moment to celebrate the fifty dollars they had so easily earned it is the way of the devotees of john barleycorn when good fortune comes they drink when they have no fortune they drink to the hope of good fortune if fortune be ill they drink to forget it if they meet a friend they drink if they quarrel with a friend and lose him they drink if their love-making be crowned with success they are so happy they needs must drink if they be jilted they drink for the contrary reason and if they haven't anything to do at all why they take a drink secure in the knowledge that when they have taken a sufficient number of drinks the maggots will start crawling in their brains and they will have their hands full with things to do when they are sober they want to drink and when they have drunk they want to drink more of course as fellow comrades scotty and i were called in for the drinking we helped to make a hole in that fifty dollars not yet received the afternoon from just an ordinary common summer sunday afternoon became a generous purple afternoon we all talked and sang and ranted and bragged and ever french frank and nelson sent more drinks around we lay in full sight of the oakland waterfront and the noise of our revels attracted friends skiff after skiff crossed the estuary and hauled up on the sand spit while hans work was cut out for him ever to row back and forth for more supplies of booze then whiskey bob and nicky the greek arrived sober indignant outraged in that their fellow pirates had raised their plant french frank aided by john barleycorn orated hypocritically about virtue and honesty and despite his fifty years got whiskey bob out on the sand and proceeded to lick him when nicky the greek jumped in with a short-handed shovel to whiskey bob's assistant short work was made of him by hans and of course when the bleeding remnants of bob and nicky were sent packing in their skiff the event must needs be celebrated in further carousal by this time our visitors being numerous we were a large crowd compounded of many nationalities and diverse temperaments all aroused by john barleycorn all restraints cast off old quarrels revived ancient hates flared up fight was in the air and whenever a longshoreman remembered something against a scow schooner sailor or vice versa or an oyster pirate remembered or was remembered a fist shot out and another fight was on and every fight was made up in more rounds of drinks wherein the combatants aided and abetted by the rest of us embraced each other and pledged undying friendship and of all times soup kennedy selected this time to come and retrieve an old shirt of his left aboard the reindeer from the trip he sailed with clam he had espoused clam's side of the quarrel with nelson also he had been drinking in the st louis house so that it was john barleycorn who led him to the sand pit in quest of his old shirt few words started the fray 
he locked with nelson in the cockpit of the ring deer and in the mix-up barely escaped being brained by an iron bar wielded by irate french frank irate because a two-handed man had attacked a one-handed man if the reindeer still floats the dent of the iron bar remains in the hardwood rail of her cockpit but nelson pulled his bandaged hand bullet perforated out of its sling and held by us wept and roared his berserker belief that he could lick soup kennedy one-handed and we let them loose on the sand once when it looked as if nelson were getting the worst of it french frank and john barleycorn sprang unfairly into the fight scotty protested and reached for french frank who whirled upon him and fell on top of him in a pummeling clinch after a sprawl of twenty feet across the sand in the course of separating these two half a dozen fights started amongst the rest of us these fights were finished one way or the other or we separated them with drinks while all the time nelson and soup kennedy fought on occasionally we returned to them and gave advice such as when they lay exhausted in the sand unable to strike a blow throw sand in his eyes and they threw sand in each other's eyes recuperated and fought on to successive exhaustions and now of all this that is squalid and ridiculous and bestial try to think what it meant to me a youth not yet sixteen burning with the spirit of adventure fancy filled with tales of buccaneers and sea rovers sacks of cities and conflicts of armed men and imagination maddened by the stuff i had drunk it was life raw and naked wild and free the only life of that sort which my birth in time and space permitted me to attain and more than that it carried a promise it was the beginning from the sand spit the way led out through the golden gate to the vastness of adventure of all the world where battles would be fought not for old shirts and over stolen salmon boats but for high purposes and romantic ends and because i told scotty what i thought of his letting an old man like french frank get away with him we too brawled and added to the festivity of the sandpit and scotty threw up his job as crew and departed in the night with a pair of blankets belonging to me during the night while the other oyster pirates lay stupefied in their bunks the schooner and the reindeer floated on the high water and swung about to their anchors the salmon boat still filled with rocks and water rested on the bottom in the morning early i heard wild cries from the reindeer and tumbled out in the chill gray to see a spectacle that made the waterfront laugh for days the beautiful salmon boat lay on the hard sand squashed flat as a pancake while on it were perched french frank schooner and the reindeer unfortunately two of the reindeer's planks had been crushed in by the stout oak stem of the salmon boat the rising tide had flowed through the hole and just awakened nelson by getting into his bunk with him 
I lent a hand, and we pumped the reindeer out and repaired the damage. Then Nelson cooked breakfast, and while we ate we considered the situation. He was broke. So was I. The fifty dollars reward would never be paid for that pitiful mess of splinters on the sand beneath us. He had a wounded hand and no crew. I had a burned mainsail and no crew. What do you say, you and me? Nelson queried. I'll go you, was my answer. And thus I became partners with young Scratch Nelson, the wildest, maddest of them all. We borrowed the money for an outfit of grub from Johnny Heinhold, filled our water barrels, and sailed away that day for the oyster beds. End of chapter, chapter 12 Nor have I ever regretted those months of mad devilry I put in with Nelson. He could sail, even if he did frighten every man that sailed with him. To steer to miss destruction by an inch or an instant was his joy. To do what everybody else did not dare attempt to do was his pride. Never to reef down was his mania. And in all the time I spent with him, blow high or low, the reindeer was never reefed. Nor was she ever dry. We strained her open and sailed her open and sailed her open continually and we abandoned the Oakland waterfront and went wider afield for our adventures. And all this glorious passage in my life was made possible for me by John Barleycorn. And this is my complaint against John Barleycorn. Here I was, thirsting for the wild life of adventure and the only way for me to win to it was through John Barleycorn's meditation. It was the way of the men who lived the life. Did I wish to live the life, I must live it the way they did. It was by virtue of drinking that I gained that partnership and comradeship with Nelson. Had I drunk only the beer he paid for, or had I declined to drink at all, I should never have been selected by him as a partner. He wanted a partner who would meet with him on the social side, as well as the work side of life. I abandoned myself to the life, and developed the misconception that the secret of John Barleycorn lay in going on mad drunks, rising through the successive stages that only an iron constitution could endure to final stupefaction and swinish unconsciousness. I do not like the taste, so I drank for the sole purpose of getting drunk, of getting hopelessly, helplessly drunk. And I, who had saved and scraped, traded like a Shylock, and made junkmen weep. I, who had stood aghast when French Frank, at a single stroke, spent eighty cents for whiskey for eight men, I turned myself loose with a more lavish disregard for money than any of them. I remember going ashore one night with Nelson. In my pocket, were one hundred and eighty dollars. It was my intention first to buy some clothes, after that some drinks. I needed the clothes. All I possessed were on me, and they were as follows. A pair of sea boots that providentially leaked the water out as fast as it ran in, a pair of fifty-cent overalls, a forty-cent cotton shirt, and a sou'wester. I had no hat. 
so I had to wear the sou'wester. And it will be noted that I have listed neither underclothes nor socks. I didn't own any. To reach the stores where clothes could be bought, we had to pass a dozen saloons. So I bought me the drinks first. I never got to the clothing stores. In the morning, broke, poisoned but contented, I came back on board and we set sail. I possessed only the clothes I had gone ashore in, and not a cent remained of the one hundred and eighty dollars. It might well be deemed impossible by those who have never tried it that in twelve hours a lad can spend all of one hundred and eighty dollars for drinks. I know otherwise. And I had no regrets. I was proud. I had shown them I could spend with the rest of them. Amongst strong men I had proved myself strong. I had clinched again, as I had often clinched, my right to the title of prince. Also, my attitude may be considered, in part, as a reaction from my childhood's meagerness and my childhood's excessive toil. Possibly my inchoate thought was, better to remain amongst booze-fighters, a prince, than to toil twelve hours a day at a machine for ten cents an hour. There are no purple passages in machine toil. But if the spending of one hundred and eighty dollars in twelve hours isn't a purple passage, then I'd like to know what is. Oh, I skip much of the details of my trafficking with John Barleycorn during this period, and shall only mention events that will throw light on John Barleycorn's ways. There were three things that enabled me to pursue this heavy drinking. First, a magnificent constitution far better than the average. Second, the healthy open-air life on the water. And third, the fact that I drank irregularly. While out on the water, we never carried any drink along. The world was opening up to me. Already I knew several hundred miles of the waterways of it, and of the towns and cities and fishing hamlets on the shores. Came the whisper to range farther. I had not found it yet. There was more behind. But even this much of the world was too wide for Nelson. He wearied for his beloved Oakland waterfront, and when he elected to return to it, we separated in all friendliness. I now made the old town of Benicia on the Carquinez Straits my headquarters. In a cluster of fishermen's arks, moored in the tools on the waterfront, dwelt a congenial crowd of drinkers and vagabonds, and I joined them. I had longer spells ashore between fooling with salmon fishing and making raids up and down bay and rivers as a deputy fish patrolman, and I drank more and learned more about drinking. I held my own with anyone, drink for drink, and often drank more than my share to show the strength of my manhood. When, on a morning, my unconscious carcass was disentangled from the nets on the drying frames, whither I had stupidly, blindly crawled the night before, and when the waterfront talked it over with many a giggle and laugh and another drink, I was proud indeed. It was an exploit. And when I never drew a sober breath on one stretch for three solid weeks, I was certain I had reached the top. Surely, in that direction, one could go no farther. It was time for me to move on. 
for always drunk or sober at the back of my consciousness something whispered that this carousing and bay adventuring was not all of life this whisper was my good fortune i happened to be so made that i could hear it calling always calling out and away over the world it was not canniness on my part it was curiosity desire to know an unrest and a seeking for things wonderful that i seemed somehow to have glimpsed or guessed what was this life for i demanded if this were all no there was something more away and beyond and in relation to my much later development as a drinker this whisper this promise of the things at the back of life must be noted for it was destined to play a dire part in my more recent wrestlings with john barleycorn but what gave immediacy to my decision to move on was a trick john barleycorn played me a monstrous incredible trick that showed abysses of intoxication hitherto undreamed at one o'clock in the morning after a prodigious drunk i was tottering aboard a sloop at the end of the wharf intending to go to sleep the tides sweep through carquinez straits as in a mill race and the full ebb was on when i stumbled overboard there was nobody on the wharf nobody on the sloop i was borne away by the current i was not startled i thought the misadventure delightful i was a good swimmer and in my inflamed condition the contact of the water with my skin soothed me like cool linen and then john barleycorn played me his maniacal trick some maundering fancy of going out with the tide suddenly obsessed me i had never been morbid thoughts of suicide had never entered my head and now that they entered i thought it fine a splendid culminating a perfect rounding off of my short but exciting career i who had never known girl's love nor woman's love nor the love of children who had never played in the wide joy fields of art nor climbed the star cool heights of philosophy nor seen with my eyes more than a pinpoint surface of the gorgeous world i decided that this was all that i had seen all lived all been all that was worth while and that now was the time to cease this was the trick of john barleycorn laying me by the heels of my imagination and in a drug dream dragging me to death oh he was convincing i had really experienced all of life and it didn't amount to much the swinish drunkenness in which i had lived for months this was accompanied by the sense of degradation and the old feeling of conviction of sin was the last and the best and i could see for myself what it was worth there were all the broken-down old bums and loafers i had bought drinks for that was what remained of life did i want to become like them a thousand times no and i wept tears of sweet sadness over my glorious youth 
going out with the tide. And who has not seen the weeping drunk, the melancholic drunk? They are to be found in all the barrooms. If they can find no other listener telling their sorrows to the barkeeper who is paid to listen. The water was delicious. It was a man's way to die. John Barleycorn changed the tune he played in my drink-maddened brain. Away with tears and regret. It was a hero's death, and by the hero's own hand and will. So I struck up my death chant, and was singing it lustily, when the gurgle and splash of the current riffles in my ears reminded me of my more immediate situation. Below the town of Benicia, where the Solano Wharf projects, the straits widen out into what bayfarers call the bite of Turner's shipyard. I was in the shore tide that swept under the Solano Wharf and up into the bight. I knew of old the power of the suck, which developed when the tide swung around the end of Dead Man's Island and drove straight for the wharf. I didn't want to go through those piles. It wouldn't be nice, and I might lose an hour in the bight on my way out with the tide. I undressed in the water and struck out with a strong, single overhand stroke, crossing the current at right angles. Nor did I cease until, by the wharf lights, I knew I was safe to sweep by the end. Then I turned over and rested. The stroke had been a telling one, and I was a little time in recovering my breath. I was elated, for I had succeeded in avoiding the suck. I started to raise my death chant again, a purely extemporized farrago of a drug-crazed youth. Don't sing yet, whispered John Barleycorn. The Solano runs all night. There are railroad men on the wharf. They will hear you and come out in a boat and rescue you, and you don't want to be rescued. I certainly didn't. What? Be robbed of my hero's death? Never. And I lay on my back in the starlight, watching the familiar wharf lights go by, red and green and white, and bidding sad sentimental farewell to them, each and all. When I was well clear in mid-channel, I sang again. Sometimes I swam a few strokes, but in the main I contented myself with floating and dreaming long drunken dreams. Before daylight, the chill of the water and the passage of the hours had sobered me sufficiently to make me wonder what portion of the straits I was in and also to wonder if the turn of the tide wouldn't catch me and take me back ere I had drifted out into San Pablo Bay. Next, I discovered that I was very weary and very cold, and quite sober, and that I didn't in the least want to be drowned. I could make out the Selby smelter on the Contra Costa shore and the Mare Island lighthouse. I started to swim for the Solano shore, but was too weak and chilled, and made so little headway, and at the cost of such painful effort, that I gave it up and consented myself with floating, now and then giving a stroke to keep my balance in the tide rips which were increasing the commotion on the surface of the water and new fear i was sober now and i didn't want to die 
I discovered scores of reasons for living, and the more reasons I discovered, the more liable it seemed that I was going to drown anyway. Daylight, after I had been four hours in the water, found me in a parlous condition in the tide rips off Mare Island where the swift ebbs from Vallejo Straits and Carquinas Straits were fighting with each other, and where, at that particular moment, they were fighting the flood tide setting up against them from San Pablo Bay. A stiff breeze had sprung up, and the crisp little waves were persistently lapping into my mouth, and I was beginning to swallow salt water. With my swimmer's knowledge, I knew the end was near. And then the boat came. A Greek fisherman running in for Vallejo. And again I had been saved from John Barleycorn by my constitution and physical vigor. And in passing, let me note that this maniacal trick John Barleycorn played me is nothing uncommon. An absolute statistic of the percentage of suicides due to John Barleycorn would be appalling. In my case, healthy, normal, young, full of the joy of life, the suggestion to kill myself was unusual, but it must be taken into account that it came on the heels of a long carouse, when my nerves and brain were fearfully poisoned and that the dramatic, romantic side of my imagination drink maddened to lunacy was delighted with the suggestion and yet the older more morbid drinkers more jaded with life and more disillusioned who kill themselves do so usually after a long debauch when their nerves and brains are thoroughly poison soaked End of chapter 12。Chapter 13。So I left Benicia, where John Barleycorn had nearly got me, and ranged wider afield in pursuit of the whisper from the back of life to come and find. And wherever I ranged, the way lay along alcohol-drenched roads. Men still congregated in saloons. They were the poor man's clubs, and they were the only clubs to which I had access. I could get acquainted in saloons. I could go into a saloon and talk with any man. In the strange towns and cities I wandered through, the only place for me to go was the saloon. I was no longer a stranger in any town the moment I had entered a saloon. And right here let me break in with experiences no later than last year. I harnessed four horses to a light trap, took Charmian along, and drove for three months and a half over the wildest mountain parts of California and Oregon. Each morning I did my regular day's work of writing fiction. That completed, I drove on through the middle of the day and the afternoon to the next stop. But the irregularity of occurrence of stopping places, coupled with widely varying road conditions, made it necessary to plan the day before each day's drive and my work. I must know when I was to start driving in order to start writing in time to finish my day's output. Thus, on occasion, when the drive was to be long, I would be up and at my writing by five in the morning. 
on easier driving days I might not start writing till nine o'clock. But how to plan? As soon as I arrived in a town and put the horses up, on the way from the stable to the hotel, I dropped into the saloons. First thing, a drink. Oh, I wanted the drink. But also, it must not be forgotten that, because of wanting to know things, it was in this very way I had learned to want a drink. Well, the first thing, a drink. Have something yourself to the barkeeper. And then, as we drink, my opening query about roads and stopping places on ahead. Let me see, the barkeeper will say. There's the road across Tarwater Divide. That used to be good. I was over it three years ago, but it was blocked this spring. Say, I'll tell you what, I'll ask Jerry. And the barkeeper turns and addresses some man sitting at a table or leaning against the bar further along, and who may be Jerry or Tom or Bill. Say, Jerry, how about the Tarwater Road? You was down to Wilkins last week. And while Bill or Jerry or Tom is beginning to unlimber his thinking and speaking apparatus, I suggested that he join us in the drink. Then discussions arise about the advisability of this road or that, what the best stopping places may be, what running time I may expect to make, where the best trout streams are, and so forth, in which other men join, and which are punctuated with more drinks. Two or three more saloons, and I accumulate a warm jingle, and come pretty close to knowing everybody in town, all about the town, and a fair deal about the surrounding country. I know the lawyers, editors, businessmen, local politicians, and the visiting ranchers, hunters, and miners, so that by evening, when Charmian and I stroll down the main street and back, she is astounded by the number of new acquaintances in that totally strange town. And thus is demonstrated a service John Barleycorn renders, a service by which he increases his power over men. And all over the world, wherever I have gone, during all the years it has been the same. It may be a cabaret in the Latin Quarter, a cafe in some obscure Italian village, a boozing ken in Sailor Town, and it may be up at the club over scotch and soda. But always it will be where John Barleycorn makes fellowship that I get immediately in touch and meet and know. And in the good days coming, when John Barleycorn will have been banished out of existence along with the other barbarisms, some other institution that the saloon will have to obtain, some other congregating place of men, where strange men and stranger men may get in touch and meet and know. But to return to my narrative, when I turned my back on Benicia, my way led through saloons. I had developed no moral theories against drinking, and I disliked as much as ever the taste of the stuff. But I had grown respectfully suspicious of John Barleycorn. I could not forget that trick he had played on me, on me, who did not want to die. So I continued to drink, and to keep a sharp eye on John Barleycorn, resolved to resist all future suggestions of self-destruction. In strange towns, I made immediate acquaintances in the saloons. When I hoboed and had the price of a bed, a saloon was the only place that would receive me and give me a chair by the fire. I could go into a saloon and wash up, brush my clothes, and comb my hair. 
and saloons were always so damnably convenient they were everywhere in my western country i couldn't go into the dwellings of strangers that way their doors were not open to me no seats were there for me by their fires also churches and preachers i had never known and from what i didn't know i was not attracted toward them besides there was no glamour about them no haze of romance no promise of adventure they were the sort with whom things never happened they lived and remained always in the one place creatures of order and system narrow limited restrained they were without greatness without imagination without camaraderie it was the good fellows easy and genial daring and on occasion mad that i wanted to know the fellows generous-hearted and handed and not rabbit-hearted and here is another complaint i bring against john barleycorn it is these good fellows that he gets the fellows with the fire and the go in them who have bigness and warmness and the best of the human weaknesses and john barleycorn puts out the fire and soddens the agility and when he does not more immediately kill them or make maniacs of them he coarsens and grossens them twists and malforms them out of the original goodness and fineness of their natures oh and i speak out of later knowledge heaven defend me from the most of the average run of male humans who are not good fellows the ones cold of heart and cold of head who don't smoke drink or swear or do much of anything else that is brave and resentful and stinging because in their feeble fibres there has never been the stir and prod of life to well over its boundaries and be devilish and daring one doesn't meet these in saloons nor rallying to lost causes nor flaming on the adventure paths nor loving as god's own mad lovers they are too busy keeping their feet dry conserving their heartbeats and making unlovely life successes of their spirit mediocrity and so i draw the indictment home to john barleycorn it is just those the good fellows the worthwhile the fellows with the weakness of too much strength too much spirit too much fire and flame of fine devilishness that he solicits and ruins of course he ruins weaklings but with them the worst we breed i am not here concerned my concern is that it is so much of the best we breed whom john barleycorn destroys and the reason why these best are destroyed is because john barleycorn stands in every highway and byway accessible law protected saluted by the policemen on the beat speaking to them leading them by the hand to the places where the good fellows and daring ones foregather and drink deep with john barleycorn out of the way these daring ones would still be born and they would do things instead of perishing always i encountered the camaraderie of drink i might be walking down the track to the water tank to lie in wait for a passing freight train when i would chance upon a bunch of alky stiffs an alky stiff is a tramp who drinks druggist's alcohol immediately with greeting and salutation i am taken into the fellowship the alcohol shrewdly blended with water is handed to me and soon i am caught up in the revelry 
with maggots crawling in my brain and John Barleycorn whispering to me that life is big and that we are all brave and fine, free spirits sprawling like careless gods upon the turf and telling the two-by-four cut-and-dried conventional world to go hang. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Back in Oakland from my wanderings, I returned to the waterfront and renewed my comradeship with Nelson, who was now on shore all the time and living more madly than before. I, too, spent my time on shore with him, only occasionally going for cruises of several days on the bay to help out on short-handed scow schooners. The result was that I was no longer reinvigorated by periods of open-air abstinence and healthy toil. I drank every day, and whenever opportunity offered I drank to excess, for I still labored under the misconception that the secret of John Barleycorn lay in drinking to bestiality and unconsciousness. I became pretty thoroughly alcohol-soaked during this period. I practically lived in saloons, became a bar-room loafer and worse. And right here was John Barleycorn getting me in a more insidious, though no less deadly way than when he nearly sent me out with the tide. I had a few months still to run before I was seventeen. I scorned the thought of a steady job at anything. I felt myself a pretty tough individual in a group of pretty tough men. And I drank because these men drank and because I had to make good with them. I had never had a real boyhood, and in this, my precocious manhood, I was very hard and woefully wise. Though I had never known girls love even, I had crawled through such depths that I was convinced absolutely that I knew the last word about love and life. And it wasn't a pretty knowledge. Without being pessimistic, I was quite satisfied that life was a rather cheap and ordinary affair. You see... John Barleycorn was blunting me. The old strings and prods of the spirit were no longer sharp. Curiosity was leaving me. What did it matter what lay on the other side of the world? Men and women, without doubt, very much like the men and women I knew, marrying and giving in marriage, and all the petty run of petty human concerns, and drinks too. But the other side of the world was a long way to go for a drink. I had but to step to the corner and get all I wanted at Joe Vigie's. Johnny Heinhold still ran the last chance, and there were saloons on all the corners and between the corners. The whispers from the back of life were growing dim as my mind and body soddened. The old unrest was drowsy. I might as well rot and die here in Oakland as anywhere else. And I should have so rotted and died, and not in very long order either, at the pace John Barleycorn was leading me, had the matter depended wholly on him. I was learning what it was to have no appetite. I was learning what it was to get up shaky in the morning, with a stomach that quivered, with fingers touched with palsy, and to know the drinker's need for a stiff glass of whiskey neat in order to brace up. Oh, John Barleycorn is a wizard dopester, brain and body, scorched and jangled and poisoned, 
return to be tuned up by the very poison that caused the damage. There is no end to John Barleycorn's tricks. He had tried to inveigle me into killing myself. At this period he was doing his best to kill me at a fairly rapid pace. But, not satisfied with that, he tried another dodge. He very nearly got me, too, and right there I learned a lesson about him. Become a wiser, a more skillful drinker. I learned there were limits to my gorgeous constitution, and that there were no limits to John Barleycorn. I learned that in a short hour or two he could master my strong head, my broad shoulders and deep chest, put me on my back, and with a devil's grip on my throat, proceed to choke the life out of me. Nelson and I were sitting in the overland house. It was early in the evening, and the only reason we were there was because we were broke, and it was election time. You see, in election time, local politicians aspirants for office have a way of making the rounds of the saloons to get votes one is sitting at a table in a dry condition wondering who is going to turn up and buy him a drink or if his credit is good at some other saloon and if it's worth while to walk that far to find out when suddenly the saloon doors swing wide and enters a bevy of well-dressed men, themselves usually wide and exhaling an atmosphere of prosperity and fellowship. They have smiles and greeting for everybody, for you, without the price of a glass of beer in your pocket, for the timid hobo who lurks in the corner and who certainly hasn't a vote, but who may establish a lodging-house registration. And do you know, when these politicians swing wide the doors and come in, with their broad shoulders, their deep chests, and their generous stomachs which cannot help making them optimists and masters of life, why, you perk right up. It's going to be a warm evening after all, and you know you'll get a souse started at the very least. And, who knows, the gods may be kind, other drinks may come, and the night culminate in glorious greatness. And the next thing you know, you are lined up at the bar, pouring drinks down your throat and learning the gentlemen's names and the offices which they hope to fill. It was during this period, when the politicians went their saloon rounds, that I was getting bitter bits of education and having illusions punctured. I, who had poured and thrilled over the rail splitter and from canal boy to president. Yes, I was learning how noble politics and politicians are. Well, on this night, broke, thirsty, but with the drinker's faith in the unexpected drink, Nelson and I sat in the overland house waiting for something to turn up, especially politicians. And there entered Joe Goose, he of the unquenchable thirst, the wicked eyes, the crooked nose, the flowered vest. Come on, fellows, free booze, all you want of it. I didn't want you to miss it. Where, we wanted to know. Come on, I'll tell you as we go along. We haven't a minute to lose. And as we hurried uptown, Joe Goose explained. It's the Hancock Fire Brigade. All you have to do is wear a red shirt and a helmet and carry a torch. They're going down on the special train to Hayward's to parade. I think the place was Hayward's. It may have been San Leandro or Niles. 
and to save me i can't remember whether the hancock fire brigade was a republican or a democratic organization but anyway the politicians who ran it were short of torchbearers and anybody who would parade could get drunk if he wanted to the town'll be wide open joe goose went on booze it'll run like water the politicians have bought the stocks of the saloons there'll be no charge all you got to do is walk right up and call for it we'll raise hell at the hall on eighth street near broadway we got into the firemen's shirts and helmets were equipped with torches and growling because we weren't given at least one drink before we started were herded aboard the train oh these politicians had handled our kind before at haywood's there were no drinks either parade first and earn your booze was the order of the night we paraded then the saloons were opened extra barkeepers had been engaged and the drinkers jammed six deep before every drink drenched and unwiped bar there was no time to wipe the bar nor wash glasses nor do anything save fill glasses the oakland waterfront can be real thirsty on occasion this method of jamming and struggling in front of the bar was too slow for us the drink was ours the politicians had bought it for us we'd paraded and earned it hadn't we so we made a flank attack around the end of the bar shoved the protesting barkeepers aside and helped ourselves to bottles outside we knocked the necks of the bottles off against the concrete curbs and drank now joe goose and nelson had learned discretion with straight whiskey drunk in quantity i hadn't i still labored under the misconception that one was to drink all he could get especially when it didn't cost anything we shared our bottles with others and drank a good portion ourselves while i drank most of all and i didn't like the stuff i drank it as i had drunk beer at five and wine at seven i mastered my qualms and downed it like so much medicine and when we wanted more bottles we went into other saloons where the free drink was flowing and helped ourselves i haven't the slightest idea of how much i drank whether it was two quarts or five i do know that i began the orgy with half pint draughts and with no water afterward to wash the taste away or to dilute the whiskey now the politicians were too wise to leave the town filled with drunks from the waterfront of oakland when train time came there was a round-up of the saloons already i was feeling the impact of the whiskey nelson and i were hustled out of a saloon and found ourselves in the very last rank of a disorderly parade i struggled along heroically my correlations breaking down my legs tottering under me my head swimming my heart pounding my lungs panting for air my helplessness was coming on so rapidly that my reeling brain told me i would go down and out and never reach the train if i remained at the rear of the procession i left the ranks and ran down a pathway beside the road under broad spreading trees nelson pursued me laughing certain things stand out as in memories of nightmare i remember those trees especially and my desperate running along under them and how every time i fell roars of laughter went up from the other drunks they thought i was merely antic drunk they did not dream that john barleycorn had me by the throat in a death clutch but i knew it 
and I remember the fleeting bitterness that was mine as I realized that I was in a struggle with death, and that these others did not know. It was as if I were drowning before a crowd of spectators who thought I was cutting up tricks for their entertainment. And running there under the trees, I fell and lost consciousness. What happened afterward, with one glimmering exception, I had to be told. Nelson, with his enormous strength, picked me up and dragged me on and aboard the train. When he had got me into a seat, I fought and panted so terribly for air that even with his obtuseness he knew I was in a bad way. And right there, at any moment I know now, I might have died. I often think it is the nearest to death I have ever been. I have only Nelson's description of my behavior to go by. I was scorching up, burning alive internally in an agony of fire and suffocation, and I wanted air. I madly wanted air. My efforts to raise a window were vain, for all the windows in the car were screwed down. Nelson had seen drink-crazed men, and thought I wanted to throw myself out. He tried to restrain me, but I fought on. I seized some man's torch and smashed the glass. Now, there were pro-Nelson and anti-Nelson factions on the Oakland waterfront, and men of both factions, with more drink in them than was good, filled the car. My smashing of the window was the signal for the antis. One of them reached for me and dropped me and started the fight, of all of which I have no knowledge save what was told me afterwards and a sore jaw next day from the blow that put me out. The man who struck me went down across my body, Nelson followed him, and they say there were a few unbroken windows in the wreckage of the car that followed as the free-for-all fight had its course. This being not cold and motionless was perhaps the best thing that could have happened to me. My violent struggles had only accelerated my already dangerously accelerated heart and increased the need for oxygen in my suffocating lungs. After the fight was over and I came to, I did not come to myself. I was no more myself than a drowning man is who continues to struggle after he has lost consciousness. I have no memory of my actions, but I cried, Air! Air! so insistently that it dawned on Nelson that I did not contemplate self-destruction. So he cleared the jagged glass from the window ledge and let me stick my head and shoulders out. He realized partially the seriousness of my condition and held me by the waist to prevent me from crawling further out. And for the rest of the run into Oakland, I kept my head and shoulders out, fighting like a maniac whenever he tried to draw me inside and here my one glimmering streak of true consciousness came. My sole recollection from the time I fell under the trees until I awoke the following evening is of my head out of the window, facing the wind caused by the train, cinders striking and burning and blinding me while I breathed with will. All my will was concentrated on breathing on breathing the air in the hugest lungful gulps I could, pumping the greatest amount of air into my lungs in the shortest possible time. It was that or death, and I was a swimmer and diver, and I knew it. And in the most intolerable agony of prolonged suffocation, during those moments I was conscious, 
I faced the wind and the cinders and breathed for life. All the rest is blank. I came to the following evening in a waterfront lodging house. I was alone. No doctor had been called in. And I might well have died there for Nelson and the others, deeming me merely sleeping off my drunk, had let me lie there in a comatose condition for seventeen hours. Many a man, as every doctor knows, has died of the sudden impact of a quart or more of whiskey. Usually one reads of them so dying, strong drinkers on account of a wager. But I didn't know then. And so I learned, and by no virtue nor prowess, but simply through good fortune and constitution. Again, my constitution had triumphed over John Barleycorn. I had escaped from another death pit, dragged myself through another morass, and perilously acquired the discretion that would enable me to drink wisely for many another year to come. Heavens, that was twenty years ago and I am still very much and wisely alive, and I have seen much, done much, lived much, in that intervening score of years, and I shudder when I think how close a shave I ran, how near I was to missing that splendid fifth of a century that has been mine. And, oh, it wasn't John Barleycorn's fault that he didn't get me that night of the Hancock Fire Brigade. End of chapter 14